Hey, I'm Julie Rose. Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm an author, creator, and enthusiast, and I've always been intrigued by the things that people are super into. So every week, I'll introduce you to another fascinating human who's into really interesting stuff. Welcome back, or welcome. A quick heads up before we get started that the show will be on a break for the first two weeks of January, and we'll be returning on the 19th. But of course, during that time, you'll have 30 episodes of Love What You Love to binge, or time to catch up on any episodes that you've missed. And before we close out the year, I'll let you know about my favorite podcasts, so you can check those out as well while we're on break. Okay, without any further ado, let's get right to this week's guest. Yanan Wang is a Princeton-educated geologist, natural historian, and avid fossil and mineral collector. In this conversation recorded back in November, we talk rock tumblers, how to get your hands on one of the rarest minerals in the U.S., the rules around fossil and mineral hunting, meteorites, finding fossils in your own backyard, and so much more. So find out why Yanan loves mineral and fossil hunting, and why you might learn to love it too. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. I'm so glad you're here. I'm excited to talk with you. You are known as Fossil Locator on Twitter. How long have you been collecting fossils and minerals? Uh, I started collecting rocks when I was a kid, probably age seven or eight. I found a fossil in a stream, and <gasps> it turned out to be a crinoid stem. What and is that? Uh, crino- <laughs> a crinoid is... Um, they're also called sea lilies. They're echinoderms, so related to sea urchins and starfish and stuff like that. Except they're they look like plants because they're all feathery mm. and have long stalks and they live underwater. And uh, yeah, these have been around in the fossil record for I think at least four or five hundred million years. Oh my gosh! And yeah, they are still alive today. So I found a small piece of one in a river, and that's where I got my start in, as in uh, fossil and rock collecting. And so what it, when you found the rock like and the fossil, did you know what it was, or did somebody say, hey, that looks like a fossil? I knew it was a fossil. I just didn't know what it was a fossil of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, And was this like just like in a riverbed near your house? Where did you grow up? Oh, yeah. I grew up in upstate New York. This would have been Middletown. And this was just in a housing development. There was a small creek that ran through the development. And I was just playing in the creek and found it. People think that you have to go on big <laughs> digs or something, but you can find it in your backyard, literally. That's <laughs> yep. so cool. That's so cool. So now did you, um, was your family into rock collecting or were you just a really curious kid? Uh, I was just a really curious kid. <laughs> <laughs> did you have other, um, Interests uh, when you were a kid beyond uh, kind of fossils and rock collecting? Uh, coin collecting. Oh. Uh, a little bit of that. Uh, I was very much into nature and the outdoors and stuff like that. So all this natural world stuff just comes along naturally. <laughs> sure, sure. And did you end up getting um, going to school for that? Yeah, eventually I went to Princeton University and majored in geosciences uh, with a focus in sedimentology. Oh, my goodness. And so what, what is that? Uh, sedimentology, it's basically how things deposit, how layers of rocks are formed, like what sediments make up different layers. And also, I also specialized in mass extinctions. So like the K, what well, was then the KT, now KPG mass extinction and like what killed the dinosaurs, stuff like that. So you, that's what you specialized in? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, cool. So um, that's not a big subject at all. <laughs> um, so now, now that you're kind of um, an adult, uh, have you continued uh, doing fossil collecting and, like, and, and mineral collecting? And how do you go about doing that? These days, let's see. Uh, yes. Uh, after college, uh, I did some various, a lot of random odd jobs and stuff, but I still kept a foot in the rocks and minerals i would go every year i would go on a fossil mineral collecting trip across the country 
and tried to hit up sites and stuff like that. I also went to a lot of fossil and mineral trade shows. Do they always kind of come together? Like there's not like a separate mineral show and a separate fossil show. Like it's always kind of a, a joint thing. Yep, they they are a joint thing. They're considered part of the same like rock collecting category. Okay, okay, got it, got it. When you're doing mineral collecting, do you like go digging? Or is it like in a quarry? Like is it different in every state? It's basically different in every situation like uh, uh growing up well, i used to do a lot of like collecting in what's called road cuts so you ever see like you're driving along a road or a highway and like they you see the rock exposed on the side of the road that's a road cut and oftentimes it goes through really interesting rocks and you can find really interesting minerals and fossils there and uh there's road cuts there's like streams there's like a lot of quarries and stuff, but you need to usually get permission to dig in quarries. And uh, road cuts, they collecting road cuts have its own like uh, dangers because of cars and traffic. And in some states, you're no longer allowed to collect in road cuts. So you've gone to every single state then to to find uh, rocks. <laughs> is that is that right? To every single state? Uh, no, okay. I've not been to Alaska or Hawaii. Okay, but <laughs> almost every single state, okay? Yep. <laughs> um, and so how, I mean, obviously the geology is, is very different across, across the country. It's a, such a huge country. Um, what differences, uh, especially in minerals, do you find, you know, from one part of the country to the other? Well, let's start with uh, fossils. Yeah, That's okay, easier to talk totally. About in terms of this. Okay, so... Fossils, a lot of fossils are time dependent. So if a location you're in only has a specific, specific rocks from a specific time or era, then you're only going to find fossils from that time. And then there's some states like uh, New Hampshire, which contains a lot of granite. And granite is an igneous rock, which means it's volcanic in origin. And therefore, you're not going to find any fossils mm -hmm. there. <laughs> right, right. So it really depends state – well, area by area so like along the east coast you find a lot of fossil shark teeth and in the midwest in like shallow like usually like uh within the top soil of the earth you might be able to find uh lots of mammoth remains or ice age fossils in the towards the rocky mountains you start getting into like some older rocks and you find dinosaurs and ocean and marine fossils stuff like that and on the west coast you have uh fossil walruses and sharks and stuff like that wow <laughs> so uh, for fossils it's all time dependent for minerals it's also dependent on the type of rock you have so on the east coast you have a lot of granites and metamorphic rocks and some sedimentary rocks so you have an assortment of stuff but nothing too gem worthy except for in like the blue ridge mountain areas of like north carolina where you can find emeralds and things and then you find more gemstones like on the west coast and in between, like, say, the Midwest, you really don't get any gemmy minerals, but you do get some minerals. But then you have some places like North Dakota, where it's mostly like prairie and you don't really have any interesting minerals. <laughs> so there's a lot of variance just depending on the terrain, the rocks and the history of the place. This is a, a very dumb question, but what's the difference between a mineral and a gem? Uh, a mineral is very specific. Give me, let me pull up the proper definition so I can read this out. <laughs> All right. So as defined by the International Mineralogical Association, a mineral is an element or a chemical compound that is normally crystalline and that has been formed as a result of a geological process. So minerals are compounds that have a crystalline atomic structure. So Various crystals and elements can be minerals, like gold is a mineral and an element. Quartz is a mineral that's composed of silicon and oxygen. So that's what a mineral is. And minerals have to be formed geologically and not by hand. So if I grow, like, say, a salt crystal in a bottle, that's not a mineral because I grew it. Oh, so it's just a crystal at that point. Exactly. Okay. A mineral has to be naturally formed. And uh, as for a gemstone, basically a gemstone is any mineral or occasionally like organic material that's uh, attractive and wor uh, has worth. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's it's kind of just a completely subjective definition. Exactly. Okay. It's like I could I could take like glass and polish it into like a really nice, pretty object, and it could be considered a gem by some people. And what is it about gems? I mean. People love collecting them. Um, is it 
is it just the visceral experience of them? I don't know. It's like part of it is visceral. Some where where humans and like like I guess uh, like crows and ravens were attracted <laughs> to shiny objects. Um, I mean, I don't have enough of the uh, psychological sure. slash evolutionary background <laughs> to dive into that, but I'm pretty sure humans, as part of our forming of intelligence are attracted to the things that are shiny things that attract our attention it's like why have we like treasured gold for over five thousand years and gemstones for at least three thousand so we've always had this interest in things that are pretty it's just part of our nature (laughs) sure sure and in terms of the history of gemstones do you know I mean, obviously, we don't know the first time someone saw a mineral and polished it up and said, oh, that's pretty. But do we know the earliest example of of a gemstone? Uh, I know that humans have worked uh, ivory, like woolly mammoth ivory, since at least the Ice Age, <gasps> probably thirty to 40,000 years ago. So would you call it a gemstone or would you call it like a gemmy object? But it's something that like we turn into a necklace like polish things into beads or uh, pearls or other organic things we just turn objects into jewelry so the jewelry aspects has been around for a while that's where polishing into like a gemstone where you polish several surfaces and make it into like a crystal that's i believe that's been done since the roman era do you, when you collect minerals, do you also polish them into gemstones? Like, what do you do with the things that you find? Oh, there's a variety of things. It's like sometimes I just prefer objects in their natural, like what I consider their like natural perfect state. And then there's other things like uh, recently I bought a whole bunch of uh, rough gemstones that I've been sending away for faceting by like gemstone makers. So it all depends. Like some I like it in the original shape and some... I like better as a gemstone. So is it just to kind of dependent on how it looks or like where you found exactly. it? Exactly. If something's like has a natural crystal shape and it's perfect, I don't really see a need to like change it. Mm. But if something's broken and fractured, but has enough clarity in it that it can be turned into something else, then I send it away to be polished into a gemstone. Let's say somebody who's listening says, hey, I want to go find some minerals and turn them into gems, would you say, like, get a rock tumbler? Like, what's the best way for people to get started on doing that? I would say, actually, a rock tumbler is probably one of the easier ways to do so. It's like you just put things in there, you put some grid in there, and then let's leave it on for a few days, and yeah. Or uh, one of the easier things to try is um, you can actually get sandpaper and then get some softer gemstone material, for example, amber. And you could actually hand polish amber on pieces of sandpaper. I'm sure it's difficult to choose, but do you have a favorite mineral or gem? Uh, my favorite mineral is rhodochrosite. It's a manganese mineral, and it's also the state uh, mineral of Colorado. It's Jolly Rancher cherry red. That's the best way to describe it. And it's beautiful, and it's uh, it's found in uh, probably a few. There's probably only about six places in the world that's produced it in any quantity. And the material from Colorado is the best in the world. And uh, that's my favorite uh, favorite mineral. As for a favorite gemstone, um, I actually, uh, I'm a fan of diamonds just because there's, well, humans have been interested in diamonds for a while. And with the uh, history of marketing and such, diamonds have become very popular. <laughs> Uh, also, diamonds come in a variety of colors, including like blue, green, pink, red, orange, basically almost every color of the rainbow. It's just uh, fascinating and rare. <laughs> and so what causes those different colorations? Uh, and, are, uh, and are they found in different parts of the world? Yes. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, the different colorations are caused by just... Well, one, uh, impurities, like a little bit of just the element, uh, nitrogen's a good one. So a little bit of extra nitrogen inside the crystal lattice itself will give it a different color. Also, the, occasionally there's like damage from just natural radiation, and that'll change the color as well. So yes, nitrogen's a good example. So just a little bit will change, like, say say a perfect diamond is clear with without any color. Nitrogen, I believe, will make it like slightly brown color. But if you heat treat it, 
the nitrogen can also like cause the diamond to change colors from brown to more brown or to white or to blue. So different things like that can happen. As for location, um, in general, for example, Argo, the Argyle region of, of Australia has more pink diamonds than some other regions. Or like Arkansas has more uh, white and yellowish color diamonds than other regions. So there's some minor differences in the regions, but you have the potential to get any color in any area. You've gone all over the country and, and presumably around the world too to find fossils and, and, and uh, minerals. What is like the most amazing place that you found a fossil or a mineral? Hmm, that is an interesting question. Let me think about that. Actually, uh, probably my favorite, uh, actually both mineral, fossil, and gem collecting <laughs> was in uh, this place in Nevada. It's called Virgin Valley. It's west of this uh, middle of nowhere area called Denial, D-E-N-I-O. And if you just look west of there, it's just like empty desert. And in this area is some of the best uh, opal in America. It's gem quality black opal. And it was formed as silica rich water replaced fossil tree limbs. So you find these chunks of opal that are shaped like tree limbs. So it's both a fossil and a gemstone. <laughs> oh my gosh. So what do you so when you find something like that, do you like do you just take the whole I mean, obviously you don't want to break it up. So how do you get it out of there? Well, it's it's going to break. It's ah. going to break into smaller pieces, and then you'll have to like piece it back together. That's just the nature of it. <laughs> Most of the sites there, there's like, it's all claimed by this point. So you have to pay uh, mine owners like a small fee to like go and dig the stuff. And it's you just dig uh, usually in piles of stuff, so it's already a little bit broken, but you can still find a lot of really good material. And that actually leads me to another question, which is, you know, if folks want to go out and just search for fossils and minerals what are the rules around that ah good question now for the united states uh for fossils if it's found on private property it belongs to the landowner or uh it belong if so if you go collecting and you go on, want to go on someone's land you need permission to go collect if it's fossils found on federal land it belongs to like uh, but I guess technically the government or the people and it depends on where you are and what your intentions are and what you're trying to collect. So, for example, uh, some of the current rules are if you're trying to collect on Bureau of Land Management land, if you're trying to collect some common invertebrate fossils for your own collection, that's usually allowed. But if you, you are not allowed to collect vertebrate fossils, so like a dinosaur bone, that's illegal. And Collecting for commercial purposes or barter is also illegal of both any type of fossil. And as for national monuments or national parks, it's completely illegal to collect anything there, including minerals. Now, for minerals, uh, on BLM land, it varies, I believe, depending on the jurisdiction and what you're trying to do with it. But in some places, you're allowed to file mining claims. If you find something interesting, you file a claim and then start mining it. So it's kind of first come. First come, first serve, file your paperwork. And as a disclaimer, always check the rules and check the current laws before you go out there because it's like laws change all the time. So my preference is still to collect on private land where I have permission to collect. And usually does the uh, landowner let you keep what you what you find? Oh, yeah. Most landowners, like as long as you work something out with them, whereas long as, if like, for example... Uh, I've never discovered a dinosaur, but a lot. This is very common. It's like if you want to go dinosaur hunting, you make a, you work it out with the landowner so that they get twenty five percent of the final selling price if you like find something valuable and sell it. Is there a preferred way to sell it? Like I'm sure there's probably a black market. So like where where would you actually sell uh, fossils that you find? Well, let's see if you if you like done everything like legally and stuff, you can just sell it on eBay. There's a there's an entire fossils and mineral section on eBay. <laughs> eBay is is kind of notorious for I mean it has everything and and there's a lot of fake stuff there too. So how would you how would you recommend people confirm that something is actually a legitimate fossil? Uh, that's a very tough question. <laughs> that's like something you just have to learn from experience mm. and like 
look into like the reputation of the seller and things like that. It's like one, there's a lot of fake fossils out there and there's also a lot of fake minerals out there and especially fake gemstones. So there's like fakes in all three categories. So uh, I usually recommend buying only from dealers in the U.S. That way they have like a little more standing behind them. Like if you buy from someone like overseas, like it's going to be difficult to like do a reverse credit charge or something like that. <laughs> so it's like one buy from us dealers to check the reputations if you can. And no, it's always fine to ask questions. It's like most of the, uh, most of the like mineral and fossil dealers, if something's like legit and you have a question, they'll be happy to answer it and like tell you where they got in stuff like that. I'm sure you've amassed quite a collection over the years. What do you do with these things when you find them and or purchase them? What starts happening is like first I keep all of it and then I get something better of it. like for example say I have a rhodochrosite it's like a nice like oh 10 gram rhodochrosite and then next year I get another rhodochrosite except this one's 20 grams and much nicer then I end up selling the previous one so it's it's like a game of continuously upgrading <laughs> okay got you're leveling up every time got yep. it <laughs> yeah. um and so how do you like display them do you keep them like how do you how do you keep, just keep them let's see i have some of my better pieces in a nice display cabinet everything else it's in what's called flats if you ever gotten like a whole bunch of beer or a whole bunch of cans you have this really flat box at the bottom with like four uh, four sides that's called a flat. That's what all mineral collectors and fossil collectors keep their stuff in. For the stuff that's like not top grade, they just sort of like keep it in boxes. For most rocks, they're completely fine. You don't really have to do anything. Uh, for some, it's like you have to make sure they stay dry. Or some, you also have to make sure they stay wet or moist. For example, some opals will dry up fairly easily and then crack. But then there's like some minerals, like a lot of like metallic minerals where you don't want it to get wet. So if it gets, those you have to keep dry. So, <laughs> yeah, it it varies a lot. <laughs> and so and so you said rhodochrosite is your favorite. Does that get polished into a gem state or just depends on the specimen? I've never sent a rhodochrosite to be polished. Part of this reason is because rhodochrosite likes to cleave, which means it breaks along the internal crystal lattice. So if you try to polish it, it wants to break into little pieces. You rarely see it as a gemstone just because it likes to break so much. What is the most, uh, I don't want to say rare, but what's the maybe rare or hard to get your hands on mineral? Benitoite is pretty rare. Benitoite is the state gemstone of California, and it's only found in one place in the world, in California. And the place it's found is one quarry, probably about like 100 yards across. So whoever owns that quarry at the time has controls like the world's supply of Benitoite. <laughs> What is the quality of benitoite? Ooh, it's this blue triangular mineral, and it cuts into a nice gemstone with a super high dispersion. So there's a lot of nice color from it. So it looks like a diamond once it's, like, cut. So it's, like, rare and attractive, and it does what's called fluorescence, is which is, like, if you put it under a black light, you can see all a uh, bright blue color of it. So it has a lot of interesting properties, and it's just really rare because of location. You've written a couple of books, and like I said, your your next one is coming out next month. What was like? What compelled you to write these two books? Oh uh, well, I started on the first one, Fifty State Fossils, because one day I was thinking, hey, there's not a book about the official state fossils that's for kids. I mean, there's another one that's done, but it's like for adults and with a lot of like pretty good words, but very few pictures. I was like, there really should be a kid's version of this. And so I just went ahead, pitched it and then wrote it. <laughs> nice. And so same same thing with the gems and minerals then. Yeah, I decided I needed a follow up book because I, I did a fossil book. And it's like, I don't know, I, I hate the process of like writing it. <laughs> but then afterwards, I kind of missed the process. So it's like, <laughs> hmm. I kind of want to write another book because now I'm not doing as much as I was. <laughs> right, right. So is there another topic, another book that you... Yes. Yeah? Uh, my next book is going to be on meteorites. Ooh. So tell me about meteorites. Like, how common are they really? 
strikes are fairly rare, but they're also fairly common. So it's hard to describe like how rare they are. Mm. It's just, can you find a meteorite? Yeah, if you're in the right location with the right conditions, you can probably find a meteorite. Technically, you can find a meteorite almost anywhere, except for like in the ocean. But yeah, meteorites are easier to find in desert locations just because they get preserved longer there. Meteorites don't like moisture. So if they landed in like the Pacific Northwest or the East Coast forest, they're only going to last probably a few months until they're destroyed. Unless it's like a big metal meteorite or something that could last like a few thousand years. But eventually most meteorites get destroyed just from erosion. What is the actual definition of a meteorite? Are they lots of different kinds of, of makeups of different chemicals, minerals, etc.? So meteorites are essentially rocks from space. <laughs> now, there are a lot of different types of meteorites. There's like the iron meteorites, uh, which are essentially iron and nickel. And they represent like the core of like destroyed planets and such. Stony meteorites, which are made up of small rocks. Uh, there's palisites, which are sort of a mixture of in between, but like they're like iron meteorites with gem crystals of olivine. And then there's like lunar and Martian meteorites, which are chunks of the moon and Mars that were knocked out into space by larger meteor impacts. And then they drifted their way to Earth. Your book then will be kind of like a field guide to figuring out what's what's what. Yep, indeed. <laughs> cool. Oh, that's really cool. When is that going to be coming out? That one's probably at least a year and a half away. So what was the most surprising thing that you learned or rediscovered when you were researching the Gems and, Mineral, Min, Gems and Minerals book? One thing I've been like learning about is how much the uh, Native Americans, indigenous people were already using these resources before we started using them. So in a lot of state guides, for example, like um, turquoise and stuff and like or copper. Uh, Okay, there's like multiple lead, or lead minerals, turquoise, copper. A lot of this material, like various guidebooks or state guides will say, oh, this was first discovered in 1836. <laughs> but if you actually look into it, the Native Americans of that region were already using it and coring it for hundreds of years before we colonized it. <laughs> so it's like that's a lot of stuff. I put a lot of that into the book just like indicating that, yes. Uh, indigenous people were mining copper in Mich in what is now Michigan for probably hundreds, if not thousands of years before we started doing so. Or copper is because it's a metal, it's useful. Uh, whereas for um, turquoise, it's pretty, it's <laughs> and it's used for jewelry. So it's yeah, it varies depending on the material. Now I know, so you've you've done work for you know the fifty states. Have you any plans to uh, do books or guides for international mineral hunting or fossil hunting? Uh, maybe. <laughs> the problem with international is, um, well, part of it is like the market. Mm. <laughs> it's like if I did another a book internationally, it's like how many people in another market are going to be interested in this book? And so it's like that. So there's a lot of like thought that goes into writing a book. A lot of thought into, it goes into it because of what the publisher is going to think about it. It's learning to write, writing a book, it's been this huge learning curve, which has been very interesting. Have you gone fossil or mineral hunting uh, outside the U.S.? I did some research back in undergrad in Morocco for some of the fossil bearing deposits oh. there. But that was like more of a scientific thing rather than like uh, for fun. <laughs> right, right. So what would you say is the biggest misconception people have about um, minerals or fossils? A lot of people think like fossils are rare. You're not going to find a fossil where every fossil belongs in a museum. But throughout the U.S., there's a lot of fossils and a lot of them are very common. For example, fossil brachiopods, which are these uh, shells that look like seashells, but they're a completely different family of organism. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of them in, like, for example, the state of Kentucky. You could stop at most road cuts in Kentucky and probably find a brachiopod. Or uh, some fossil fish. There's a fossil fish called Nydia, which is the state fossil of Wyoming. And there's literally billions of these. There are several quarries you could pay to go collect that. And for like uh, 40 bucks for half a day, you could just sit there and break rocks open and find these fossil fish. And you'll probably find one every, like, 
15 minutes. So it's like, yes, some fossils, like some fossil dinosaurs and, th- and things, are rare and do belong in museums. And especially anything that's new to science certainly belongs in a museum. But if it's something where you literally have thousands of it, I'm I'm all right with like people being able to collect it and own it. <laughs> And the way people can check that is... Researchers are happy if you reach out to them, especially these days on Twitter. And that's one of the things I did. It's like, um, one of the things I do is I'm very much into amber. I buy a lot of amber for various collection and jewelry purposes from the Dominican Republic. And what I do is like I keep an eye out for interesting fossil insects in amber. And if I find something that looks really funky, I reach out to some researchers I know, and either they'll know what it is or they won't know or they'll point me in the right direction. And if it's something completely new, we usually like partner together and write a paper on it and I donate it to a museum of their choice. And so I've done this several times and it's a great way to both participate in a hobby and participate in a science. I get to work on a paper and introduce something new to the world and science gets a new piece for the scientific record. So it's a, to me, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, that's thrilling. <laughs> that's thrilling. So if people, uh, you know, they go out and they're, they're doing some fossil collecting or, or mineral collecting, mm-hmm. they don't know what they've got. Like, mm-hmm. how, would they, how would they find the right researcher? I mean, you, you're a scientist. You're kind of in the community. You know, you, you know where to look. But how would, like a newbie, where would they go? reach out to various paleontologists on Twitter, they'll point you one direction or another to, to eventually until you get to someone who knows what you're looking at. And it's like they're even welcome to like um, go and like tag me and then if it's something or I know something about it or know where they should talk to, I could like point them in the right direction. And this actually happens fairly frequently. <laughs> cool. That's cool. That's exciting for you too because you get to see new stuff. and Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, just... Uh, just like uh, yesterday, someone uh, reached out to me in a DM on Twitter and was like, hey, I found this fossil in a creek and it's really weird because it's an ammonite. I don't think it's supposed, it's supposed to be here. So I take a look at it. I was like, yep, that's an ammonite. Uh, that looks like a dactylil cerus. Uh, it's from the UK or Germany. Where'd you find it? He's like, oh, I found it in a creek in San Jose. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, here's this person who was just like happily looking at rocks in a creek, and they pull out this ammonite, and, okay, so my speculation is either someone accidentally dropped it, or someone, like, used it in a magic ritual, then tossed it into the creek, or something like that, because it has a polished base on the bottom, like, the rock it's sitting on is polished, so it used to be a display piece. (laughs) Right, oh, got it, got it, so it wasn't, like, some some new discovery it was just somebody no. <laughs> a, a human yep somebody it had it and they either lost it or tossed it away but it hey it was a, it's a uk ammonite or german ammonite found in california <laughs> it's a fun story and someone gets a gets to bring home a uk ammonite that traveled halfway around the world <laughs> i love it i love it it's so cool so if if someone wants to get uh, started in fossil collecting or mineral collecting and they're a little intimidated to get started, what would you recommend? How would you recommend they get started? My best suggestion is to either join a local rock collecting club. And there's usually like little rock collecting clubs in like probably every major town in the country. Or go to a local gem and mineral or gem mineral fossil show once uh, COVID is over and stuff like that. And there's like about every year... Uh, pre-COVID, there's usually about a dozen gem shows every weekend around the country. So eventually they'll be able to find one that's somewhere near them and they could like go in person and both learn more about rocks and minerals there and they also buy rocks and minerals there. And usually the vendors there are pretty um, on the up and up. Most of them. Yeah. Like, I would say 90% are because like I've been to gem and mineral shows and like 90% are good. And then there's like some guy who will have like a tray of fake fossils from Morocco or something <laughs> oh, like no. that. So it's like, yes, it's still buyer beware, but it's easier for you to ask questions in person. <laughs> a way to figure out if something's like legitimate or not is if it's too good to be true, it probably <laughs> is. If you're looking at this piece of amber the size of your hand, it has a perfect scorpion in it and the guy <laughs> wants 20 bucks. It's not real. <laughs> That's... Same with a mineral. If you see a really nice, pretty, giant mineral thing, it's like a absurd color, like neon blue, and it's like 20 bucks. Yeah, it's not real. 
And when when people are collecting, do you recommend that they just like collect what looks interesting to them, what's pretty to them? Do they do you collect in categories? Like how do people ah, usually yes. do that? Okay, that's a good question. Um well, people initially everyone starts off collecting like all sorts of things that they just like like mm-hmm. and eventually they gravitate to things. Like I gravitated to like certain classic american minerals like benitoite rhodochrosite stuff like mm-hmm. that that's stuff that's mined in the u.s and hard to starting to become hard to get so everyone will start off and then eventually they'll like find what really what they're passionate about and then start focusing in on that so mineral show is a good way to kind of get an overview yeah yep that way you see a lot of things in person yeah cool well Thank you so much for taking so much time to talk with me about this. This is um, absolutely fascinating, and I'm so excited that you have two books for people to read because um, I know people are going to get really excited about this, too. (laughs) So thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. Man, he is so passionate and so knowledgeable. That was a huge treat. Don't forget, Yanan's new book, The 50 State Gems and Minerals, is available now wherever you get books. You can find him on Twitter, at Fossil Locator. And he's got a Mineral of the Month Club on Patreon. I'll include those links in the show notes, as well as links to the Goodreads pages for his books. Just a reminder that you can find this podcast on Instagram at LoveWhatYouLovePod, on Twitter at WhatYouLovePod, and the website is LoveWhatYouLovePod.com. Zeke Rodriguez-Thomas at MindJam Media provides amazing editing assistance. You can find Zeke at MindJamMedia.com. Also, all of the episode transcripts for Love What You Love are available on the website. Many, many thanks, as always, to Emily White for the fantastic transcripts. If you need transcripts yourself, reach out to her at hireemilywhite at gmail.com. The music for Love What You Love is called Inspiring Hope by Pink Sounds. A link to that artist is included in the show notes. Okay, y'all, that's it for this week. Get out there, love the hell out of whatever it is that you love. You need it and we need it. Thanks for listening. Let's hang out again soon. But there's some good in this world, Mr. Furl. And it's worth fighting for.